Well, welcome, bienvenidos to today's core peer learning circle, which is part of a series we're doing about grant reporting. Today, we're gonna to talk about tips for data visualization. And these peer learning circles, um, as you'll see, are a slightly different format from our usual core coffee chats. They're more of a conversation among us where we can all share tips and learn from each other. I'm Nicole Lezen, one of the local consultants who facilitates a countywide initiative called Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or Core Investments, along with Nicole Young. We're your host today, and we're joined by our colleagues, Jane Conklin, Stella Lauerman, who's providing simultaneous interpretation, and Gisela Carrasco, who's providing consecutive interpretation and translation in the chat. I'll start um, a transition to some slides that Nicole Young will go over. Great, thanks, Nicole. So we'll do just a little overview about CORE for anyone who might be new. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see again that CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. And it's both a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan in Santa Cruz County. And on the next slide, you'll see that we keep this mission and vision uh, that has equity at the center, kind of front of mind in all of the uh, areas of work that we do with CORE. And you'll see on the next slide that we often refer to this concept of the core conditions for health and well-being. Uh, everything that we do and build and create and teach in CORE is centered on creating these eight vital interconnected core conditions for health and well-being, again, with equity at the center. And so on the next slide, you'll see events like today, uh, today's peer learning circle, they're offered as part of what we call the CORE Institute for Innovation and Impact. So think of the CORE Institute as the learning arm of CORE Investments, where we offer an array of training, technical assistance, and other opportunities like this for people from all different sectors to build uh, shared knowledge and skills and systems that we need to be able to fulfill that collective vision of an equitable, thriving, resilient community. I'll hand it back to Nicole. Thanks, Nicole. So we just wanted to say a few words about the core peer learning circle format. As I mentioned earlier, these are different from our usual core coffee chats, but they're still all about learning. They're designed to be more informal and conversational um, so that we can just have a conversation centered around a theme, in this case, um, data visualization tips, and that we can share our own tips and challenges and learn from each other along the way. So today's theme on data visualization tips is partly due to timing. Around this time, the end of many fiscal years, there are many grant reports that are due um, to funders. And we just hope that this will be useful in a lot of different ways throughout the year. And um, just wanted to mention that on Thursday, we're doing another session like this, but on broader uses of these uh, reports that you may be making to funders. So um, we hope this whole series is helpful, both for the, the focus on reporting, but also for these broader uses. So when we asked you when you were registering, if you had any questions, um, these are the ones that were submitted. So we have um, the question about best practices around integrating qualitative and quantitative data. We have a lot of curiosity about what's worked for everyone, um, if people are willing to share those things, as well as anything that you feel might be a big no-no or not helpful. Um, and of course, we welcome any other questions you may have brought that didn't, didn't make it onto the registration form. So at this point, are there any questions that you know you'd like to add to this list? Just feel free to raise your hand or just jump in. Okay, well, let's um, dive into our first question then. Oops, sorry, jumped ahead. Um, Jane, I believe this may have been one of yours about what are the best practices around integrating qualitative and quantitative data. Is there anything you wanted to, to add at this point? Um, well, I think for me, you know, qualitative data is something I think it's really powerful. And it's kind of, I, I've said this before, it's like coming into its own, it's really having a moment, people are really interested, and the stories are really powerful. 
And so sometimes I feel like in my own work, trying to, you know, here's a table, here's a quote, here's a table, here's a quote, and trying to kind of make it tell a more cohesive story, I think is um, really important. So I think for me, just kind of every time I feel like I discover something a little bit new around that. Um, but I, I like to kind of have quotes, you know, uh, sort of a, a quote that's descriptive or powerful from participants, if I can, and then thinking about other ways to present qualitative data, I feel like that's um, a little bit more challenging, personally, so if people have good ideas about that. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. So I'll open it up to all of us. What, what um, tips or resources do you use when you're trying to integrate qualitative and quantitative data? Does anybody have something to share? Or maybe you're currently struggling with the same thing. If you have um, a report that's due that's asking for both kinds of data, and as Jane said, you want to highlight both and tell a more complete and coherent story, but it's hard to do. If anybody feels brave enough to share that challenge or something you're struggling with in this regard, and that this applies to all of the questions, we, we welcome some group problem solving here. I'd like to share something. This is Alicia with uh, Pajaro Valley Unified School District. Thank you. Great, Alicia. Um, thank you. Go hosting, ahead. Yeah, thank you for hosting up. I guess for uh, one of the most, um, we have had a lot of challenges uh, just uh, trying to gather data and um, and keep data because a lot of times it's in um, yeah. with our families, we do um, yeah. kind of interview and, and then it's coming back with all of those, those answers and figuring out what are the most common needs, yeah. challenges, et cetera. So uh, we do a lot of interviews for, um, especially for our Mixteco families because um, it is a non-written language. So we have to have conversation with them. And then our, um, also for our, um, I know that our migrant and uh, seasonal head start department is very engaged in doing those interviews initially with families and then using that as uh, data to support their own services. But uh, it's a lot of um, uh, interviews. Uh, I get the empathy interviews and conversation with families. And Alicia, could I ask, what are you currently doing with all of that data that you collect? Is it in in some sort of transcripts or... How is it recorded? Okay, um, so this is they use it actually just to kind of um, design programs and uh, for the families. Um, I don't. I think it's basically just kept in a kind of a spreadsheet format. There isn't a um, there isn't a more uh, formal format. Mm -hmm. We are uh, currently trying to work with ASR. Uh, to try to do some more quality, to kind of gather more data from the recent uh, local control accountability plan input that we had, because we have received a lot of input from our families and we haven't been able to really dive into it. So we're going to be diving in and finding out what is the best way of uh, making this data count for us. That's great. That's probably a pretty common challenge. You Even if you have interesting responses and data from people you're working with, the next step of how to keep it organized, how to analyze it to pull out some themes, how to be fair to all the different um, points of view, things that are more common, things that might be very interesting outliers. Um, that's It's a lot of time and effort to do that consistently um, with every wave of information that you keep getting, for example, from incoming families every every year. Um, so, uh, so we wish you luck with that. But we're, we'd be really interested in hearing how that goes along. Kind of what what you find that's that sweet spot between um, being able to work with the data that you do have and kind of extract some some themes and ideas and insights without making that your whole uh, work life to, to be doing that all the time. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I look forward to getting some of that too. Um, and um, yeah, like you said, it's very dif difficult 
we were part, we are part of a, the California, uh, uh, I'm sorry, CEI, Community Engagement Initiative for the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence. And I have to share with everyone and here that the most difficult task that we have, and this is a whole bunch of districts working together, is actually finding ways to measure data, whether it's in any way, we don't have the tools to measure engagement. Mm -hmm. And and it's, we entered hoping that, that that was going to give us some insight. And now four years into it, no one has yet the tools. So we are hoping to be able to develop something that is uh, share, that's a shared practice amongst educational um, agencies that can talk about effective engagement practices with uh, families. That sounds fantastic. And when you feel ready, we would love to host a discussion about that for a broader audience here through a core coffee chat or something Thank similar. You. Yeah, so please, please stay in touch. Um, we, we have, this is not related necessarily to the analysis piece, um, Alicia, but the um, have a tool that we wanted to share with people who may or may not be familiar with Stephanie Evergreen. She is um, somebody who's taught us a lot about um, visualizing different kinds of data, both qualitative and quantitative. And so this might be helpful to you and others. Um, Gisela will put in the chat a link to a qualitative data chart chooser that's part of her website. Some of the resources we'll share with you are available just by clicking on a link as, as you'll see in the chat and others, um, you might have to either um, share your email address with her so you can get on her list or um, have some kind of, um, if you attend a training or become part of a, a training curriculum of hers that involves other costs, that might be another way. But just for now, we wanted to share this, this resource. And she also has a series of books um, that have a lot of this information in them and are very accessible. They're written in a very easy, um, easy to follow style as kind of workbooks with lots of examples. And so if that's your thing, if you're more of a, um, a reader than a, a website rabbit hole explorer, um, there are many ways to get to this, but oh, thanks Nicole's sharing her screen. So these are some of the examples of different kinds of charts that visualize some data once you have it. And this is just to encourage all of us to go beyond bar charts and pie charts or whatever our, our default modes might be in Excel or other programs. And, and to encourage, you know, just some, some other ways of thinking about what your point is and what you're trying to say. So you can see um, she's got some lively language there as well. And she herself is very, um, very good at practicing what she preaches. So all her materials um, look great and have a lot of uh, key points that, that jump off the page to you. So that's one resource that we wanted to share. And we wondered if anybody had other resources about, particularly about integrating qualitative and quantitative data, but really about any of these sorts of examples. Anyone else? Well, let's let's move on to our, sorry, go uh, ahead. something, Nicole. Um, I think one of the, I know for myself, whenever I do surveys, like the idea of asking open-ended questions or in focus groups or listening sessions, right? The idea of asking open-ended questions is really appealing because you know, then you can allow participants to share things in their own words and not feel boxed into answering a certain way. Um, and also that's what makes the analysis so difficult afterwards because people might say things in very different ways and you're trying to look for themes. So you, you, know, you still have to go through those steps to somehow identify the themes in order to figure out then which kind of chart or which kind of visual will help tell the story and highlight those themes in the best way. Um, and so if there are, that might be more than what we have time to get into today in terms of like 
tips or, or suggestions or even different um, software tools or different ways to go about analyzing and, you know, coding those qualitative responses so that you can identify the themes. So if that's an area of interest for, for anyone on this call, maybe put that in the chat or at the end of this session today, we'll ask you to fill out a feedback form. Like, tell us any of those kinds of topics that you're interested in learning more about because we'll uh, try to figure out when and how we might be able to do some of those kinds of um, peer learning sessions as well. Because uh, I find that when you, when you get to the point of choosing which chart, <laughs> that's like the fun the fun part, <laughs> right? Trying to figure out which which visual is going to be the most appealing and engaging. Uh, there's still you know some learning and skill involved in getting your data into that kind of chart, but even getting to that point in terms of analyzing and identifying your themes is a can be a monster. Um, and so sometimes things like thinking about you know, what kinds of themes might emerge if you ask the question in this way can help, like if you join that thinking on the front end can help you then by the time you get to analyzing and, and uh, creating a visual. Thanks, Nicole. So the next question was what's worked for others? So if you have something that was a success story that you'd like to share, yours or someone else's, um, please feel free. And we, we can um, share screens, all of us, if that's comfortable, or, or you can just describe something or whatever works for you. The link in the chat. Alicia, I think Your tile was lit up. I'm not sure if you were. Sorry, no, I was typing. Oh, typing. Okay. For others to share, I don't want to have cognitive. <laughs> Does anybody else have an example that's coming to mind? So, one um, suggestion, and we'll, and we'll go over this when we go over some, some tips, is if you are not sure about how to expl explain something visually in terms of your data and the audience for, for this series of peer learning circles was funders. So if, if your audience is a funder, sometimes you're going to be limited by the format of your report. So if you're doing one of those online reports that's got drop down menus or some blocks for text, there's not much opportunity to put in charts and graphs, but, um, but you may have some information in there that, you know, a, a percentage change in something or something that showed some impact on the families you're working with or something like that, that would lend itself to a chart for other purposes. So even if you can't necessarily use their format, um, it's still worth thinking about for, you know, beyond that report, but also you can try to see what a funder's own uh, website and reports might look like and see if that gives you some ideas of the kinds of things they're interested in and the kinds of things they may find compelling both in terms of style and content. So just, just to kind of test this theory out, um, we looked at the Kellogg Foundation site, which is a, a funder of a, a lot of different kinds of initiatives in California and elsewhere. And I'll just share briefly, this is an example of a report on maternal mental health. So they've got this, um, this headline about the US is failing moms. And in their report card format, which is a very common way to show comparisons of different places or districts or zip codes or states, um, 42 states received Ds and Fs. And then they also had this example of where you could look at, they have a social media toolkit, but they have this interactive map where you can look at your state's report card along these different gradients and compare yourself to the top states. California is in that category, but with a B minus, so lots of room for improvement, or the many, many bottom states. So they're using a lot of different 
um, tools here to try to engage people in thinking about this issue and, and um, learning how dismal it is and what could be done because they have recommendations as well, luckily. But that's just one example of if you went to your funder's website and saw something like this, maybe it would give you some ideas for what you'd want to do yourself. I'll put these links in the chat. Does anybody else have examples of how you try to figure out what might be? Hi, um, this is Annalisa. Hi, Annalisa. Hi. Yeah. Um, I work with Ecology Action and um, I'm newer to writing some of our narrative reports for our funders in the Bay Area. Um, what the direction that I was given, which does seem to work, is sometimes just to send over a report format, either one that has been used in the past or um, something new to the funder and just keep the email really short and say, would this meet your needs? Is this helpful? Please let me know. And then, and that's always because it's just something very short. Um, it's something that has been appreciated. So that's just kind of a, a way that we've gone about understanding what the funder wants and what they like. That's great. Yeah. And it's nice to hear that a lot of funders are recognizing that reports you may have and proposals for that matter that you may have created for others might suit their purposes just fine to try to ease the burden on grantees. So that's, that is really helpful. We hope that trend continues. Thanks if for I that may, example. Uh, Go ahead, Alicia. I just wanted to share real quick a, um, because it talks about, um, we do once a year, we've done it for the past five years, a uh, youth truth survey, for example. And we found the most difficult thing is because it goes out to students, families, and staff. And the most difficult time is to some thing is to summarize it all so that it gives some feedback because we realize that when we ask community for feedback, we wanna give them results back. So if I may share with you the uh, page of our yeah. summary. By all means. So that you can, um, you can see, uh, can you see this use through feedback? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so, so this is really good because what we try to do is let them know that we are listening to them. And in the past, um, so we have let them know um, how many people we heard from, uh, divide, uh, uh, kind of identified by students, families, and staff. And we give them a little bit of uh, information about what happened the year prior. But then we go and we take all of the student successes. We take the top three strengths um, between like elementary, middle, and high school. And then uh, we, we take our uh, strengths and we build on those. Um, and we include a little bit of quotes from the, those people, like especially students, because there are uh, those the ones we serve. And then um, we get some uh, because serving vulnerable populations is so important for us. Uh, we actually do highlight what the the um, the strengths from there those uh, serving those populations have been. And then we go into challenges and opportunities because based on that feedback, we do understand that we as a as a as an agency have the opportunity to grow in, in some areas. And we realize here, for example, in, in, in all of across the street, it was all relationships for all family, students and staff. They all thought that we could grow and be stronger in relationships. So, um, so how are we promoting that? We let them know um, how we can promote this um, strengthening of relationships through what systems we have in place. Um, another one we heard of like that was a big concern was safety. So we talked a little bit about safety um, and what kinds of play things we have in place to support uh, students not feeling safe or families or staff when they visit our campuses. And then we offer it in Spanish. So all of our information is done in English and Spanish. We try to make it look so that it's very um, consumable by all uh, by all of those who are um, uh, reading it, who may be reading it. And that's another, another great thing to talk about is like when we talk about data, it has to be consumable by the audience that you wanna, um, that you wanna reach. 
So thank you for letting me share that because it was really great to look into all of that data and trying to exert what was important in all of those throughout those was really a wonderful experience. Well, Alicia, thank you. I mean, that just showcases so many of the things that we're talking and thinking about here. So the, um, the giving feedback and results back to the people who provided you with the information in the first place, so important, so often overlooked. So um, kudos for that. Starting and leading with strengths and assets before you turn to challenges and problems. Also, you know, uh, something that we all try to do and try to remember to do, but sometimes get that magnetic pull back to the starting with problems and challenges. So that was so nicely done. And I love the mingling of the, the personal quotes um, with, with the charts and data. And it just, the information really pointed to, here's what we're doing, here's where we can improve, very actionable sorts of things. So just kudos all around, that looks great. Um, any other um, questions for Alicia about that? How, how um, th it sounds like this is an ongoing uh, presentation and uh, data collection effort. So how long does it, what's the interval between the data collection and putting something that wonderful together? So we have it, we open it for about three weeks to four weeks during the fall semester. And then we try to have it usually within like at the beginning of the spring semester, which is in June and January. Mm -hmm. We try so to have it quick back. turnaround. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So that makes it feel current too. Yes. Yes. It's not too long. It, you cannot, because otherwise it becomes irrelevant, even though the data is still quite relevant. People will, are not thinking anymore about the fact that they completed a survey for this purpose. Right. Right. Well, and it sounds like, I know you noted in that there were some dips in participation, but not huge ones. So it sounds like you've got pretty, um, consistent participation. We have been really trying to increase participation every single year. We are going through a declining enrollment and we have not seen it happen so much, but we've gone from 21,000 students to about almost 16,000 in the last few years. And that's huge. Um, I haven't seen it so bad, but um, um, and so that's one of the reasons that we can see a, uh, a decrease, but also we kept it, that's another thing we're measuring, we kept it open one week less. And, and so for us, that's a, a telling, right? That's a piece that's telling, we may need to keep it open longer and continue to promote uh, the ability or the opportunity to complete the survey. To get that last mm -hmm. bit of participation. Great. Well, thank you for sharing that great thank example. Thank you for letting me. Yeah, anytime. Does anybody else have an example to share either something you're proud of or something you're struggling with? So uh, another um, tool to get to uh, get closer to something like what Alicia just shared, um, no matter where you're starting from, and it's also from Steph Stephanie Evergreen, and we, we admit we are fangirls, <laughs> um, has a, a data, visual data visualization checklist um, which is on um, Stephanie's website and Gisela will put the link in the chat there. There you go. Um, there also is an interactive option where you can upload your own uh, work in progress and get some feedback um, and see how it stacks up against these ratings and where you specifically might wanna pinpoint um, some effort. Nicole, do you wanna walk through this? You got up. Thanks for sharing your screen. Yeah, so you can actually um, actually let me share my screen first so you can see what the checklist looks like because you have to download it first. But I've got it up on my window somewhere here. Hold on. I've got I it. Up. I thought I do. You have it up? I do. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. wait, here it is. Okay. Okay. Too many I'm not windows. Sure I have the most too many version. windows open. <laughs> Very familiar okay. problem. 
So if you go to the website link that uh, Gisela just put in the chat, you'll see um, a site that says, uh, yeah, there's a couple options to rate your visualization, but then if you want to actually get a copy of this checklist, you can provide your name and your email address and you'll get this PDF. And so it's basically, uh, and I thought it was interesting, this is actually considered an evidence-based tool. Like stuff that is what Stephanie Evergreen does. Is she, she not just not only does great work and provides all these tools and resources, but she actually uh, does research on the effectiveness of different data visualization techniques. So this has she's published journal articles on this, um, and so this this gives you a helpful checklist and guideline about things to do in terms of your text. Uh, not only the obvious things like making sure there isn't too much text, but really that you're, uh, you know, providing some concise, descriptive titles, subtitles, or annotations so that people can quickly get the gist of what your chart is trying to say. That you have things like a certain order and size and label and use of labels that again just help um, all different all different types of audiences be able to understand the uh, the, the story in your data. You know, so she covers things like the arrangement of elements in your graph, the use of colors, um, just kind of your overall uh, visualization and, and how it appears. And so you can, if you want to actually get a score, you can upload, I'm going to go back to this website here, you can click on Rate My Visualization. And you can upload an image of a chart that you have and uh, submit it. And then you'll get a report back about how your visualization does against that checklist. And, um, and it'll come with some scoring tips about how to make it even better. And so it's a, it's a useful, I mean, you might, it's possible you'll get a score and some tips that uh, make you feel like, wow, I've got to start over completely <laughs> because there are so many things, you know, so many issues with the visualization. And um, and that's, you know, that's take it as a just a helpful learning um, opportunity to think about, oh, okay, how might others, you know, the things that make sense to us when we're creating it might actually not be clearly understood or even readable by other audiences. And so, Highly recommend trying out this tool. Um, actually, we wanted to see if anyone felt brave enough. If they have an, an image of a chart or vis visualization that you want to upload and see what kind of score comes back. And Elise, I see your question in the chat about does it take ADA compliance into account when, when rating? I believe it does. I'm going to stop my screen share for a moment so I can take a look at the, the checklist. But I know that that is um, an area also that Stephanie Evergreen is really conscientious about. And I think even has some other uh, checklists also about accessibility and 508 compliance. Um, and so if it's not specifically mentioned in this checklist, I'm pretty sure she has some other other tools as well to help with that. We can sh we can share. I didn't see it in that checklist, Nicole, but I've seen it elsewhere on her website. And I just wanted to go over this, just share this example. This is the second page of the at least the checklist version that I have, which is from 2016. And it shows you, I mean, she's picked a particularly egregious example of a standard Excel bar chart with lots of clutter and doesn't bring the main point across, but she one of her big things is to put your findings in a chart headline. So here you can see on the right how she fixed this. She showed that the instead of just saying these are the attendee breakfast preferences for a conference, you guys figure it out. It actually interprets it for you right in the chart. It says the breakfast preferences focus on protein. Most people want eggs or just a pile of bacon. But one in 10 of the attendees do not consume enough energy for their first meal of the day. So there's a lot more just in the title that helps you see 
what is happening in the chart um, than the other example. And part of that also is ordering the data and just cleaning it up so that there's less um, extraneous information, like a different color for every choice is not necessary to make this point. So just, just sharing the usefulness of this. Oh, thanks, Nicole. There's the blog post on 508 compliance in the chat. So did anybody build up some, some courage to share a work in progress and get it rated? Or perhaps you'd like to do that on your own. Well, if at any point you wanna do that, we can come back to it. But let's turn to our, our third question about anything that you find to be a big no-no or not helpful. So is the person who asked or shared this question on our call today by any chance? We, we talked about the checklist, which is one way to avoid some no-nos, at least in the Stephanie Evergreen view of the world, um, which as Nicole said, is based on a lot of work, research, as well as practice um, with a lot of different topics and audiences. Are there other, other ways that, that you use to sort of screen out what might be a data visualization that's not landing properly or the way that you intended? Do you have informal checklists of your own or a favorite reviewer? What do you do to make sure that your, your data visualizations are having the impact that you'd hope they would? Hi, Nicole, this is Annalisa again. Hi. Hi, sorry, this is actually one of my questions, um, but I think you, rephrased everything wonderfully, <laughs> so thank you. Um, yeah, and that's just coming from a place, again, of being a little bit newer to writing narratives, kind of learning along the way. Um, we have several people in just our immediate team that I work with, and some of them are also on this call today, and <clears throat> who, who write these narrative reports. Um, for the funders to contribute to the larger reports. And so I think just we've been, the method so far has been to um, kind of have like a lot of back and forth um, about, oof, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't mm -hmm. sound quite right, or that's not mm -hmm. quite clear, or that gives the like, kind of a impression that doesn't um, really highlight all of the awesome work that was done so sort of fixing things but it it's going through this this report and that feedback is kind of coming from maybe, maybe I don't know I'm wondering if there's maybe a more efficient way to do that or to um, just kind of stabilize mm -hmm. how we write these reports and, and avoid yeah if we had like some more best practices and kind of if I could hear from other folks like what kind of feedback have have you all gotten um, where how something was written? Like you said, it didn't land it land in the pro appropriate way. Um, and and what was that? And like and how how did you adjust? Great, thanks, Annalisa, for clarifying that. So, yeah. So, what what do you all do to just avoid the oof, as Annalisa described it? Of oops, that's not that's not what we meant or what we hoped for. Internal reviews, external reviews. Alicia, go ahead. Thank you. That's very important, Annalisa, Annalisa, because the way we did it in my office, for example, is that we actually always run things by the experts. If it's something about CTE, we'll go to the CTE program. We always run whatever we're going to do um, through the uh, eyes of the expert. And also, uh, for example, if it's something for parents, we want to run it by the parent department to make sure the language is adequate and consumable. Um, and I think that's one of the best uh, practices that we have here in our office because every word matters because 
We don't want to bombard our families with too many words and we have to learn. So it is a, uh, a matter of making sure that we don't keep one, um, the pieces to ourselves. We don't work in silos. We work with people around and we, we want to make sure that we sh check with them so that that understanding piece is clear and uh, understanding who the audience is. But um, doing uh, this collaboration with departments is key. Thank you, Alicia. That's a great point. And it's, it's something that just needs to be built into timelines if, if at all possible. So this isn't something that needs, needs to happen the day before the grant is due or the report is due, but just, um, and, and I suspect that Alicia, for things that are that you're repeating, like the graphic that you shared, um, you you do have a better sense of the rhythm and the cadence of when things start as a draft and get finalized and reviewed. Um, so that's kind of that's nice when you when you know that, but just um, to build that in ahead of time, at least for um, a, 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 enough time to fix things or change things, whether it's a day or a week, depends on the materials and your own. Um, other workloads and relationships, but some, something that builds that in would be a best practice, it sounds like. What, what other suggestions do you have for each other? What, what, are, what do people do to just get some feedback on all, all these kinds of products, whether they're visualizations or drafts? Does anybody use outside reviewers, outside your organization? We do that sometimes when we're writing proposals, just does it make sense to a reader who hasn't been mired in it for weeks and has fresher eyes? It helps with everything from typos to things that we thought were completely self-explanatory apparently are not. <laughs> I also think sometimes you can save time if you're the person writing the report and if the data lives someplace else is making sure that you're having the conversation with the people who are preparing the data visualizations because so my former life I've reviewed a lot I worked for several funders and reviewed a lot of reports and so you know sometimes you have that experience where here's the data visualization that seems to say one thing and then the narrative is you know from almost from a different perspective and sometimes you're really constrained, you know, in terms of if you have certain kinds of quantitative data or what the variables are or different things. And so kind of having that conversation, um, I don't know, Annalisa, what your um, agency looks like, but kind of having that conversation up front can sometimes prevent some of the back and forth of, you know, trying to kind of you get the data visualization and then you're trying to sort of retrofit it or ask them for something different that they may or may not be able to provide readily. Really a good point, Jane, because sometimes the graphic design part of it is separate from, from everything else. And it's hard for the graphic design people to, um, to necessarily understand the whole context for the data unless you help them do that. So another, another thing related to that is maybe at a staff meeting or on a regular basis to look at data that's coming in and say, you know, what is this telling you telling you? What what do people, what's the um, aha moment or realization or takeaway point or whatever you want to call it of a given finding or a set of findings because it may be that different people see different things and that could give you some clues about how to write those um, compelling chart headlines and uh, sort of leading people to a finding instead of making them work for it. And I think similarly, if there's anything really unusual or surprising in there to make sure that that's explained somewhere in the narrative, because chances are your reader is going to be like, <laughs> you know, what happened with this, you know, cliff of the data goes up and then it falls off or something like that. And that seems very apparent, but sometimes when you're really focused on meeting a particular objective or something, you may miss kind of some of those other pieces in the data. So just any surprises, I think it's nice to make sure that's explained someplace in the narrative. It's a great point too. And just last week when um, we were doing our, our uh, joint session with DataShare, hi Eva, um, there was a question just like that of, we don't know what happened in 2016, but there is some kind of blip in, in this trend line and it would be really helpful to know, was there something? Was there a policy change or a programmatic change? And 
happen to do with housing, but yeah, anything like that, that, that might just um, not be obvious to, to an, even an informed reader would be really helpful to call out when you see it in the data. Are there other questions you have for each other than the ones we've worked through today based on this conversation? Or anything else you'd like to bring forward while we have our group gathered? To add one thing to Nicole, just going back to um, I think so either either you or I said a moment ago about um, uh, creating or developing descriptive titles for data mm -hmm. visualizations. That that's um, harder than, than mm -hmm. it sounds mm -hmm. like. Right mm -hmm. to come up with a concise descriptive statement that's more than just like the title, uh, you know, like the typical title of a chart, like X, per, you know, percentage of yada yada over time, right? That that's typically how we see charts labeled, but to actually come up with a title that describes what the finding is, is a lot harder than it seems. And so that takes constant practice, I find, and writing it in a way both the narrative parts of a report, as well as data visualizations and, and descriptive um, titles, like it takes a lot of practice to write it in a way um, where even if it is, even if the, the, your audience is a funder and maybe they do understand more of the technical terms or um, kind of your usual jargony way of saying things that uh, it's a good habit and, and opportunity to keep practicing. Like, how would you say it so that your average person from the general public who knows nothing about your program, that they would be able to understand, you know, your chart title, your any notes or annotations you're making about it, the actual narrative of your, of your report, not only for the readers who are likely to see it, but just knowing how oftentimes in organizations, like, you know, one person writes something or creates something, and then the next time a report or a grant <laughs> needs to be written, right, you know, you copy paste what was written before, and so those things live on. So it's, uh, you know, it becomes really important to make sure that what's written is something that not only is understandable, <clears throat> but it's not going to be um, offensive to different readers, different types of audiences. So kind of looking at not only the words that are used, but the images, the, you know, whether they're icons or photographs, making sure that they don't, you know, unintentionally, you know, reinforce some kind of a negative stereotype or, um, you know, image or, you know, or, or kind of way of thinking about a particular issue or population. So those are just, you know, more reasons to build in that time for that group review, the group thinking, you know, an external uh, outside set of eyes who might pick up on things that even your internal group of people hadn't thought of or, or recognized. So true. And, you know, all of us are often doing things in a hurry and um, might glide over some of that and it can turn into a, a much uh, bigger and avoidable problem if, if those reviews don't happen. Been there, done that. So um, I did want to turn back to um, just a summary of some tips as we close out today's session. I think we've talked about all of these in one way or another. So one is just the importance of knowing who your audience is. So even within a funder, is it um, um, a, a particular funder? Is it a, a new program officer who may not know your program as well as the previous one? Is it, is it a new funder altogether or an established one? Um, so just knowing even within that category of funder, um, more about what they're looking for and how, how you've interacted in the past or what might be different is really important. And of course, beyond funders, we'll talk more about those other audiences in our session on Thursday. Um, having your data visualization be in service of a larger story and what are the key points that you want to bring forth. So just not treating these charts as something in isolation is really 
really helpful. Um, and again, takes some time, some investment of time and, and attention, but is well worth it um, when you are able to tell a, a fuller story with a, a series of data visualizations and points. We hope we've shared some useful tools, but there's all kinds of other tools out there. Thank you, Jane, for um, the shared, shared resource on equity in data visualization. That's an important consideration. And um, it's the, the Do No Harm Guide. There's a lot of great examples in it. Um, the link is in the chat. And then there are different talents probably within and around or adjacent to your organization that have particular skill sets for this. Not, not everybody is a visual person. So um, or visual learner. And so some people are just better at grasping the implications of data and charts than others. And they may be in all kinds of different levels in your organization and finding out who those people are and the sort of, hey, could you take a look at this before we put it in a report can be super helpful. Um, similarly, trusted reviewers for, for all kinds of materials, but especially for these kinds of materials, again, internal or external, um, trading favors uh, with somebody, you do this for them, they do this for you, but just getting another pair of eyes on things before they go outside of your, your team or your organization is always a good step if you can build that in. And then um, collecting examples of things that strike you. If, if you are reading a report or exploring a website or looking at someone else's um, funding appeals, and you think, wow, that is a really great way to show that, or that really spoke to me in some way. Just trying to collect those in a folder somewhere um, on the corner of your desk or bookshelf, those are really helpful to go back to. Sometimes you see them later in a different light or don't see an immediate application to your own data and work, but that can come later. So those are just, can be inspiring to leaf through at some point. And of course, um, having a little uh, excuse to um, look at other people's report examples as part of your, your work tasks is a nice thing to have sometimes. Any other questions before we turn to upcoming core events and some feedback surveys? Any questions or comments or resources to share with each other? I think we have some resources on the next slide, right? We do. And Gisela's putting some of these. She's got a link to this particular um, list in the chat. So you can dive into them. So we've, we've talked a lot about the Evergreen, Stephanie Evergreen um, resources, but there's some others on here, data visualization for nonprofits, the We All Count site, um, the Secret Language of Maps, which is a, a book and um, a series of resources um, from the Stanford D School that we did a series of um, learning together, or was it earlier this year? No, last year. Um, time blurs and Canva, um, which we didn't talk about, but a lot of people have found Canva really useful for kind of streamlining the graphic design process. So if you don't feel that you're a, a, a data visualization ninja or really good at using Excel charts in different ways, although I can tell you that's a steep learning curve and worth trying to ascend it. But Canva has a lot of kind of pre-made templates for things like infographics and flyers and report inserts. Um, and likewise, I'll just put a plug in for data share, a lot of our local resource, um, a lot of the um, charts and trend lines and data on data share are available in a way that you can download them into a PowerPoint or a PDF or any other kind of presentation or report. So that can be really handy as well. You don't have to create those charts yourself from scratch. Nicole, do you want to? in a plug for our next session? Yes, yeah, so we have one more of these peer learning circles focused on grant reporting happening later this week. Uh, so you can still register for that one. Um, probably the easiest thing to do is to go to the core website on the events page that Gisela just put in the, in the chat and register there. 
And we're still, we're working on building out the core institute schedule for um, hopefully July through September. <clears throat> so keep an eye out for those events. And we just wanna thank everyone for being here today and sharing your questions and suggestions. Um, and so we would love to get your feedback about today's peer learning circle. Uh, you can either click on the link in the chat to fill out the survey in SurveyMonkey or scan one of these QR codes. Or when you leave this Zoom meeting, you'll see, you should see a, a web page pop up that um, has these surveys as well. So we would like to get your feedback because we are still kind of experimenting with this informal peer learning circle format and want to get a sense of how that works for everyone and what other topics you might be interested in. Uh, so we would appreciate any feedback you have to share. And I, with that, I think we are ready to say uh, goodbye and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.